Okay, I have to admit that I'm kind of stupid. For a while, I was playing Zone, like I was playing Zoom. And you think, despite those four letter variants of Rush Poker both being named so similarly, they're actually quite different. And I was making a lot of mistakes by not playing Zone Poker, and instead I was playing Zoom Poker. And so, the difference between the two is that one of the tables is anonymous, and one of the tables is not. Um, I pretty much grew my bankroll back in the day, pre-Black Friday, playing like 1-2 and 2-4 full ring Rush. And so, Zoom or Rush, or whatever you want to call it, is actually the game that I prefer the most. And so I was super excited to sit in Zone, and I just pretty much just approached it with this very solid style that I just kind of all approach, you know, all, all my games. But then I was like, wait, these are anonymous tables. Doesn't that mean I can just, like, wild out on people really, really hard? And so I sat down and began to wild out on people really, really hard. Hard. And so I started just playing for a little bit, and as you can see, I, you know, I played for like 2,000 hands. I was like, okay, this seems to be going well. And as you can see, uh, I just made a pretty steady progress and played about like, you know, 13,000 hands or so, and made about, uh, let's see, like $1,100, $1,200, something like that, which is, you know, like 10 big blinds per hundred at uh, 100 no limit, right? Something in that kind of something in that ballpark. Um, but the thing is, I wasn't playing 100 No Limit, I was playing 25 No Limit. I think everyone thinks that the maximum cap win rate that you can have in these kind of games is like 10 big blinds per 100. And so first off, the rake is so heavy that 10 big blinds per 100 is going to already be a pretty astronomical win rate. But I think that's, you know, generally the win rate that indicates you're crushing this game, move up to the next stakes. Right? The reason that you never see crushers with uh, much higher win rates than this is if you can beat 25 no limit for something astronomical then you probably should be playing 50 no limit right if you can beat 50 or 100 no limit for something astronomical you probably should be playing 2-4 so you know i sat down it for three and a half ish days and decided to actually put in the effort and see yo how fast can i grind a grand up at 25 no limit right so if i went completely busto lost every last dime in poker and had 250 dollars on ignition how fast could I turn that into one grand, ten grand, a hundred grand? Uh, I mean, I can probably turn it into ten grand in under a month, right? Going from, you know, twenty-five no limit, no limit to a thousand, easily can move up to fifty no limit, and then you know, uh, once you have a forty dollar, fifty dollar hourly, then yeah, ten grand doesn't seem that far away anymore. So, one of the things that I wanted to point out over these <laughs> this session is that. Um, I played extremely, extremely loose. So this is six-handed tables, and I'm playing about 30% of my hands, I'm raising a ton, and I'm three-betting a ton, going to showdown a lot, and, you know, generally being a winner at showdown. Um, this, Although this number is probably a little bit high, but that might also be because I'm playing against 25 no limit players and they're putting their money in against me really, really badly. You know, so just playing super, super, super aggressively and trying to run down even uh, players that I might suspect are going to be calling stations, because, you know, like, when you play poker against idiots, one of the things is that you're always really sure of what kind of hand that your opponent has. And so, like, one of the things is, if you genuinely think that you have a talent advantage over your opponent, the two things that you should be doing is getting him to fold when he's got a worse hand, and... I'm sorry, getting him to fold when you have the worst hand, and then getting him to call when you have the best hand. So not only should you be showing down correctly when you are putting in the money in big pots, but you should also just be stealing tons and tons of small pots from your opponents because they're playing so predictably and they turn their hand face up against you very early on in a hand. And so I think, you know, when a lot of players study, they just want to study how to play big pots because they recognize that that is one of the largest mistakes that their opponents make and every time that you see a fish make a giant call down against you you're just like oh i should just never bluff in these games anymore but that is actually incorrect and the correct way to play them is to bluff people's face off right one of the things with fish is that they call too widely on early streets so if they call too widely pre-flop that means that they're gonna have to either 
overfold on the flop or they're going to have to overfold on the turn when I begin to put on the heat. And so, you know, it's possible that you run into fish who don't put fold pre-flop or on the flop or on the turn and then on the river and then you're, yeah, going to be really, really running dry when you're blasting your bluffs. But I don't think that the usual opponent, even when they're on the fishier side, is so absolutely maniacal slash suicidal that they're just going to be calling you down with like ace high when you're running triple barrels with, you know, a queen high bluff. So definitely wanted to show some of the uh, tricks in terms of how I've been extracting from my opponents when they have absolutely nothing, and then how am I running over my opponents a little bit when I have absolutely nothing, right? Those are obviously the two central tenets of being able to beat weaker players. I'm sure some people are going to be like, oh yeah, that graph is definitely not real, but I just want to show you with a couple timestamps that indeed I have been playing a buttload of uh, 25 no limit, and as you can see, just generally, you know, like, win two binds in an hour, you know what I mean, like, lose a little bit, win a couple buy-ins, and it's just like a bunch of ups and downs, but you can see that occasionally I just have some really crushing streaks and just really kind of, like, blast through these guys, and so and near, at, near the end, you can see that I have, like, a 10 buy-in upswing uh, immediately. So, just wanted to, uh, <laughs> you know, quell any doubts that indeed I am uh, playing 25 no limit, and you can see that these are all just, you know, played a bunch like Halloween morning or something like that. So, you know, just putting in putting in that good micro stakes work. And so if you're kind of curious, you know, what is the real max that you can achieve at these games? It's, yeah, it's probably pretty high. Um, as you can see here on this graph, there's definitely a, a, a streak where I'm just like kind of tilting. I was playing like really, really late in the morning. Also, I did a session uh, where I streamed a bunch of students where in a bunch of positions, I was like, this is losing, but I'm going to do it anyway because I just want to get into interesting positions so you guys can see how my thought process as I like, navigate them. So definitely was making a bunch of like negative EV like raises and just trying to like run people over just to see what would happen so you know obviously the times where I'm just playing just you know very solid and straightforward you can see that uh, my money just uh, kind of goes up in both my non showdowns and my showdown winnings right like at one point here when I'm really really just like on my game I guess my non showdown winnings were about like six buy-ins or so so at, at 8,000 hands and so you know if you're running people this um, running people over this badly and still getting your money in good, I mean, that means you're just really, really dominating people. So if you think that you have a talent advantage over your opponents, again, your goal should not just be to put the money all in with the best hand, it should be both to put the money all in and to just nickel and dime them for all of these, you know, very minor pots. So today we're going to review a couple of some of the larger pots that I play. I mean, like a bunch of them are just going to be like coolers, and so we don't really have to talk too much about like those hands. Instead, I want to focus on the times that I get all of my money from my opponent when he has nothing, or when I get my opponent to fold when I have nothing in a relatively large pot. So as you can see, a bunch of these hands, uh, when they go in, are just going to be coolers, right? I got in aces three ways against like eights and ace-queen. Here I got a guy to shove off trip eights when I had a full house. Here I check raised the guy on the flop and he floated me with ace two and then I got the IV Dwan cooler against him. Here I get quad sixes in against some hand. Kings goes in pre against aces. Here I bet twice and a guy shoves into me when I have the nut flush. I mean, these are not really hands that are interesting or worth discussing. Here I three bet pre flop and then check call three times out of position and then happen to lose the pot and so you know if you lose when you set a trap with aces on a nine nine eight eight board well then you're just gonna lose your hand here with king eight i four bet pre-flop bet really small on the flop shoved on the turn when i got there and then my opponent snaps with aces as he should and this was probably one of the largest mistakes that i made but you know it's interesting to see this hand and now that i can see my opponent's actual hole cards which is really a good feature of playing zoom so i raise a guy three bets me pretty large especially because we're deep and so i give him the finger and he calls start with a flop bet and i size up a little bit because we're a little bit deep so i just want to just punish him i put in the turn bet and he calls again and so <laughs> Here, I was, pl I was playing this on camera. I unfortunately time out here because I'm trying to figure out what is the best option here. I think the best option here is probably to shove and just get my opponent to close his eyes and call with queens or jacks. Um, but I unfortunately talk myself into like 
a third pot size bet here or something and then calling off like i really wasn't sure if the best plan was to try to like induce or something or just try to just open shove i think it's probably just to open shove and just cross my fingers especially because it's really difficult for my opponent to have aces because after i four bet preflop and we're this deep it's just unlikely that he's gonna trap right he might just like click it back preflop or like you know just try to jam on me so unfortunately i check because i time out and then my opponent jams on me which is like ultra disgusting and so like i don't know if he thinks this is for value or if this is a bluff right like maybe he thinks i have like ace king with the ace of diamonds and if i i might like talk myself into a call here or something i'm really not sure but so this is a spot where i actually just talk myself into thinking if my opponent has like jacks here is he really checking back and so there's some tiny possibility he's got like a full house of some sort that he called a nine pre-flop and so because i don't have a diamond i talk myself into a fold which is just absolutely disastrous especially because i mean like it's hard for me to think about what kind of bluffs that he has here right like i think usually i just check and this guy just checks back and then i just like get really mad at myself for losing value but to actually just get shoved off the best hand here i was uh, kind of surprised and actually i was like pretty confident about this fold in like real time because i was just like this i guess this guy just like has to have a nine of some sort like ace nine right unfortunate so the min raise under the gun, I squeeze from the small blind, and I get a call. Bet really small on the flop, I get raised, and so I start by calling because there's no need to raise. There's sometimes, some tiny percent of the time, my opponent has like a 3x type hand. Like, I mean, I guess if he has 3x, he's got like exactly ace 3, in which case I have no idea why he's raising. But so I, you know, start with the call. Obviously, just going to check to my opponent, and he pots it. And so, this is pretty much a dead giveaway, in my opinion, that my opponent is bluffing, because uh, there's no reason to actually use this bet size. Like, if you were trying to set up a river shove, like, there's just no reason to bet pot here and try to scare me off another hand. So, it just, just always just looks like a bluff to me, and so I'm just going to continue calling. And then, obviously, I'm going to check the river, my opponent jams, and so I just pick up a, you know, a buy-in just from my opponent randomly spazzing, because probably I bet really small on the flop, and then he just assumes that I cannot have a balanced range there. So he thinks that maybe because I bet a third on the flop that I got, I've got, I've got like, you know, pocket queens or something, and I'm just going to be really, really terrified to put in the money. Arguably, my favorite hand from the session comes from a min-raised small blind versus big blind pot. My opponent raises the small blind, he checks, I minimum bet. He calls. He leads the turn, which is horrifying. I mean, it's just a really bad play, right? There's just no reason for him to um, check here. I'm sorry, no reason for him to lead here. He should just check and allow me to bluff at him. Or if I have a king, then obviously he just like def definitely never wants to lead here. So I call just to you know continue to trap. And now here he checks the river. Um, I think when I bet here, I'm mostly going to be repping like a queen of clubs if I'm trying to go for like a bluff or something like that. Um, but the hands that I'm really trying to extract from when I have quad kings is obviously just going to be the lone ace. And so I decided to go I decided to go for immense immense greed here and just see if my opponent is good enough to be able to fold top full house here and not talk himself into um, somehow there being a split especially because i min bet the flop and so i think that after you min bet the flop your opponent's going to talk himself into shenanigans later on and shenanigans indeed so <laughs> definitely you know the key of some of these hands is not just going to be like oh you know like pounding the flop jamming the turn jamming the river and like i mean maybe if you do that in this particular hand your opponent is going to pay you off because then he's just going to hit top full house but you know like very often in some of these other hands when your opponent only has like six high and you have top full house then you know playing your hands in kind of unnatural ways or playing with like small bet sizings often gets a lot of action from your opponents so a quick look at what my stats look like because i am by far the laggiest player in this pool i imagine Playing, you know, extraordinarily high VPI and PFR, 3-betting my balls off from basically every position because I just don't care. I just think I'm better than opponents, and so when my opponents are, like, weaker than me, and I think that I'm going to be able to consistently win pots when, like, I have ace-10 and they have ace-jack, and uh, both of us miss or he only hits a jack, well, <laughs> then I think that I should be 3-betting my face off, or 3-betting their faces off. One of the two, either way, face off. Am I Nick Cage or am I John Travolta? Oh, that is not a pleasant decision. 
Initially, I started with a 100% button steal, so maybe this is going to be inflated. And uh, to be honest, maybe a 100% button steal actually is very good. Um, but the one thing I will say about all of this is that over this uh, session, I ended up paying like some stupid amount in rake, like $400 in rake, right? So if you are uh, playing this laggy, you're going to be paying about 12 big blinds per hundred just because you're playing a ton of ton of hands. And so I definitely think that if you have a skill edge over your opponents, you should be playing these extra hands and paying the extra rake, but then you're getting that premium from playing against complete nincompoops. However, if you are not that confident navigating these pots when you have very, like, low equity hands, if you're not really sure how to choose your low equity bluffs and kind of spots and just don't have the, you know, balls of steel to just put that money in when you think that your opponent doesn't have it, well, then maybe you should play a little bit tighter and so your plays are going to be a little bit more automatic. One thing that was kind of interesting to notice is that I place less big blinds than I do from every other position, and then I have played more small blinds, and I think that is a function of when you play zone, when you sit in, you have to sit in the big blind of the first hand, and so usually there's going to be more new players who are coming in, and so they put you in the small blind extra times to compensate. So that's kind of interesting, and uh, I wonder how much that changes things. Obviously running very, very good from the small blind, and then very, and then running very, very bad from the cutoff. So these are just artifacts of just the sample size. But generally, your opponents are so bad that I think that you should be able to sustain at least 25 fairly easily. And when I was reviewing a bunch of the hands with of my students, I made a ton, a ton of mistakes. One, out of laziness, because I wasn't using like auto hotkey scripts or table tamer. I was just pressing buttons, and so I was not actually getting the optimal bet sizing in a lot of spots. Um, and because of that, like, it definitely suffered in my BB per hundred, and I think that I should be able to inflate this by maybe five or six simply by choosing the correct preflop sizings in all of the scenarios, simply because I'm probably just, like, giving up an extra, like, one big blind preflop when I'm three betting too much, or I'm not inflating the pot by an extra half big blind preflop, and then on the flop and turn, that means that there's extra dead money that I should have been winning that I wasn't. So I definitely think that your BP per 100 here can just be improved from anything that I'm doing simply by playing more accurate bet sizings and spending less time just clicking buttons. Laziness costs. From the cutoff, as you can see, I'm still just, you know, quite, quite a maniac, even though maybe I should be chilling out a little bit because the button is just opening me a lot when I'm out of position, but maybe that is just, again, an artifact of the sample size because I'm still opening a ton of hands from middle position and clearly this is extremely profitable. If we add in flop c bet single raise pot success percentage, we'll see that my success percentage here is not from auto profiting on the flop that obviously. So very often my opponents should be folding like 25 to 30 percent compared to pile solver, and so you know to be honest, my opponent is actually picking the correct frequencies, but they're picking the combination so poorly, and they're not being aggressive enough that despite my opponent's frequencies being pretty close, as you can see, I mean I'm just still going to be running them over because they're floating me very very lightly, and then they don't know how to defend correctly on the turn, even against just very standard GTO lines. Here if I add in a quick filter, and please pardon me because I'm brand new to Hold'em Manager, as you can see I'm just <laughs> still using this trial and I've only been using this for a couple days so, simply so I can look at my ignition hands because I normally play on sites that don't allow tracking. And if we look here at my double barrels, we can see that, you know, <laughs> the double barrels are just extremely, extremely effective of getting my opponents off hands. Right, and I guess, you know, in nearly every single position I'm just, you know, absolutely printing money simply by just double barreling. Now, automatically double barreling does not necessarily work if you are using a large bet sizing strategy, right? If you just go 75% on the flop, 75% on the turn, uh, maybe you're getting your opponent to fold so many hands when you bet 75% of the pot on the flop that uh, your turn fold equity is going to be reduced very significantly. But here, because I'm keeping my opponents nice and wide, I get to really, really pound them on the turn. Which is something that is the trademark advantages of playing the small bet strategy, is that every time you put your opponent to the test when you put in a small bet, it's not just putting your opponent to a test in that moment, it's also putting your opponent to a test through different branches of his game tree, because now you might just accidentally wreck him, because he's played imbalanced on the flop, and now because he's so imbalanced on the flop, he can't possibly stand up to heat on the turn. If we put my double barrels into a replayer, we can see that, yeah, just winning like tons and tons of small pots, being kind of break-even-ish across the middle pots, but I'm definitely being compensated by winning a bajillion of these smaller pots. And then as the money goes in towards the very, very large pots, you know, I'm always going to be showing up with the goods. 
or getting coolered. But just like looking at some of these hands, immediately you can see that if you're very comfortable playing a lag style, you're definitely going to be able to run these people over. Now, I bet minimum on the flop he checks and I bet the turn again and uh, he folds. Now, I'm going to just assume that this was some kind of error that he probably timed out and so let's give, the, let's give our opponent the benefit of the doubt that he's not going to be folding top pair there, but you know, stuff like that is uh, occasionally going to happen where you get your opponent to do, do just really ridiculous things. And so, you know, this is a very standard hand, I bet really tiny on the flop, and then he checks, and then I just pound him. And then what do you do with queen high here, right? What do you do with if you have king high, ace high? There's just like a lot of different parts of your range. Ace nine, well, I mean, ace nine is going to be a call, but ace two, ace three, that maybe floated the flop, ace three of spades, right? There's going to be so many hands here that your opponent is just going to be like, uh, I don't know what to do, right? And so the overwhelming majority of the time, I'm just going to be able to pick up all these pots that my opponent has and nothing, and then I'm just willing to just lose every time I run into the top pair. Right? And like, how hard is it to make top pair in poker? It's actually surprisingly hard. Wow, this guy folds sixes from the cutoff, so let's assume this is a timeout again, but that's, you know, pretty surprising. I raise, get called, and again, this is a spot where my opponent has floated me, and now when he faces aggression on turn, he has no idea what to do. And so, because my opponent played his hand so passively, I easily won a pot from him, where, you know, I generally should lose the pot in uh, this kind of run out in this kind of uh, dynamic because he should 3-bet and then bet the flop and then maybe bet the turn and no matter what I'm just going kind to of get kind of screwed. There's also a bunch of hands where essentially betting small gets my opponent to call and then ah, what is he going to do on the turn again? Just you know, just going to be kind of a gross spot. And so over and over we just get into these positions where my opponent floats me, and then when I put on more gas, he just doesn't know what to do. So even with a hand as strong as ace-king there, he's just like, ah, I just have to fold. And obviously we can see if my opponents are flatting king-queen and ace-king out of the blinds, that one, I should be giving them a lot of respect when they try to represent a hand against me post-flop, and two, if you play these hands so passively, you're just going to get crushed against people who are just pressing the bet button. Here again, I steal super loosely, because again, I feel like I have strong control over these tables. Now, my control definitely kind of slacks off as some of my opponents go from, like, tag your players to fish your players. Because, like, when the tag your players are just very, like, fold happy, then I'm just going to run those guys over, and that was totally fine. But as you can see it in the graph, at one point I started playing in, like, the very, like, splashy drunk games or something. Maybe it's, like you know, like Saturday evening games and everyone was playing like a bajillion VPIP and then I was just like, oh, maybe I need to tighten up a little bit. So definitely feeling the aura of your zone game is going to be really important. But here, this is just going to be another common spot where I set up my opponent with the jab and then hit him with the left hook, right? And so just very often, if my opponents keep telegraphing, I don't have anything, I don't have anything, then I'm just going to run them over, right? And so if you, unless you're like a good player and you know how to play balance ranges on the, both the flop and the turn here, right? Like what hands should you call down with here in theory, right? Like, it's not necessarily that obvious, especially if I am, I mean, if I'm over bluffing or if I'm just bluffing like random hands like this, yeah, sure, you need to start be calling down with like pocket sixes, you need to be calling down with like a two. I think that majority of the time I can get my opponent to fold a five and a two, not really sure how often I'm gonna get my opponents to fold an eight, but mm, probably a decent amount of the time. And so if I'm only cutting my opponents down to kings that he didn't check raise the flop with, yeah, then he doesn't really got shit. So, you know, this is what happens when your opponents are just very, like, loose, is that they just keep showing up with air on the turn that would just, like, hoped that you would give up. And, you know, if you're a very aggressive player, don't give up. So, the moral of this story is, of course, don't play ABC poker, right? Play poker to exploit your opponents, right? Play poker that has a very solid foundation based in GTO theory, but then also recognize that when your opponents are making terrible mistakes, you should be going into Pile Solver, looking at what those mistakes are in terms of frequencies, and then learning how Pile Solver punishes these mistakes. And so maybe you want to say, oh yeah, these are just exploit poker, it has nothing to do with Pile Solver, but in fact, this is exactly the opposite. Basically, all of the things that I learned here, one, in terms of my post-flop play, I pretty much just play the same strategy that I always recommend in like all of the, you know, kind of paid materials that I present. Um, I just, you know, I bet range in a lot of spots, I check range in a lot of spots, I mix it up in pretty uh, obvious spots, but because I'm just, you know, using such solid fundamentals in all of these places, and my opponents are not, 
once I can see that they're deviating, that they're calling too loosely pre-flop, that they're floating me out of position too lightly, well then I can just realize, oh, I don't need to play GTO at all because my opponents are playing extremely, extremely weakly, and they're just going to let me run them over. And so when that is the case, when you're playing against the guys who let you run them over fairly easily, well, then, you know, you're going to have both a positive red line and a positive green line. So hopefully this was kind of eye-opening for some of you guys. Hopefully some of you guys who are playing just like way too nitty on zone need to be stepping up your game because obviously playing a very laggy style is going to be extremely profitable despite the rake being so high simply because you, the premium that you pay from rake is going to be worth it to play uh, with your giant talent advantage. Of course, this is assuming that you have a giant talent advantage and I have to also point out here like this is me playing laggy, and then this is me playing too laggy, right? So, like, the moment I play, like, too over the top, right, I start just giving all the money back because then I get kind of predictable or I'm just, like, forbidding people way too often when they have aces. So you can see here, for over a stretch, it's just me, like, just going absolutely berserk on people, and, yeah, that subsequently results in a kind of a break-even stretch. And so there's always this kind of fine line between, between being... A complete maniac and being very laggy and you know just like really owning people's souls and four betting with like ace three offsuit and then getting there and then there's also just being like overconfident thinking that you can run people over by playing any two cards and being completely wrong about that and getting owned even at a limit like 25. also to say again I made a bunch of mistakes here, right? There's some hands where I play hilariously and get snapped off by 25 No Limit players, and so, like, there's definitely going to be spots where you can improve your game as well. So hopefully that this is a, you know, kind of a good summation of what your micro stakes journey should look like. You should be putting in the money very good, you should be stealing from people when they're very predictable. If you are only doing one or the other, maybe your green line is going to go straight up, and then maybe your red line is going to go straight down. And if your red line is going straight down, then what you're doing is not stealing enough, both pre-flop and post-flop. So this was a fun little challenge. I'll probably try to do something similar at 50 no limit and 200 no limit, and just see if I can have some kind of astronomical win rate and see how fast uh, you can really, really run this up to 10k. Um, obviously, this is kind of time consuming. It took me like three and a half days or something like to, to do this. It was like something like 30 hours you can probably make like 50k a year just playing the small stakes, right? If you just were really good at 25 no limit and for some reason never ever wanted to move up, you probably could make 50k fairly easily. If you allow yourself to move up to 50 no limit as well, then yeah, you probably can make 75 or if you were just like a leather ass, you could probably make it to like 100 grand, just like really, really grinding it out like, you know, 12 to 15 hours a day if you were just that kind of degenerate. So it's just actually useful to know that, you know, you can be 25 no limit and make more than a college professor. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> Anyways, it's been Alvin Teaches Poker. Thank you guys for watching. As always, please like and subscribe. And if you're kind of interested in seeing what all of this shenanigans look like, um, please check out my own website, OvernightMonster.com, where I teach all of these, like, you know, small bet, big bet kind of uh, shenanigans. I really love the word shenanigans.